Let's open tonight's service with hymn number 44 from our hardback hymnal, number 44. And can it be? Let's all stand together in hymn number 44. Open your, by, your your hymnals back to that hymnal, no, hymn number forty four. <clears throat> it's a good um, opportunity for us to learn an important lesson. Be reminded a little bit. Eleven leavens the whole lump. If in your hymnal the word Adam in the second stanza, third line down is not scratched out, go ahead and do that. Just take a pencil or pen, scratch it out. And change Adam to his own. Christ did not die for Adam's race. He died for his own race. Um, and somebody, his own helpless race. Um, somebody, well, that's, that's so, no, that's, that's, the, that's a big difference, isn't it? Big difference. Good evening. 
Uh, Let's open our Bibles together to Proverbs chapter 9 for our call to worship. Proverbs chapter 9. Um, Todd was supposed to go home today. He called me earlier and I missed his call. Has anybody heard for sure that he's gone home? I think he, I think he did. Um, he was, sounded a lot better yesterday when I talked to him. Um, also, I got a text from Jennifer Uranic saying that Britain's mother went in the hospital this afternoon with a stroke. So Britain is there with her. Um, Proverbs chapter 9, we'll begin reading at verse 1 and read down to verse 6. Wisdom. God has made him to be for us wisdom. This is a personification of Christ. Wisdom hath builded her house. She hath hewn out her seven pillars. There's the church. She hath killed her beast. She hath mingled her wine. She hath also furnished her table. She hath sent forth her maidens. She crieth upon the high places of the city. Whoso is simple, single-minded, let him turn in hither. As for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him, Come, eat of my bread, and drink of the wine which I have mingled. Forsake the foolish, and live, and go in the way of understanding. Let's pray together. Our glorious and loving Heavenly Father, how thankful we are that you were pleased to send your dear Son the fullness of the Godhead bodily, all the wisdom of God, Reveal to us your glory. And we ask now that you would send your Holy Spirit in power. That you would give us understanding. That you would cause us, Lord, to be simple. And that we would be single-minded. Looking to Christ alone for all our righteousness. All our justification. All our hope and all our life. Pray, Lord, for Britain and for his mom and ask, Lord, that you would um, just provide grace and help in their time of need. Thank you for our brother Todd, for the hand of strength that you are putting upon him, and we ask that you would give him full recovery. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Three hundred thirty four, and let's all stand together again. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not me. Red. 
treasure thou art. High King of heaven, my victory won. May I reach heaven's joys, O bright heaven's sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever be Still be my vision, O ruler of all. Please be seated. Would you open your Bibles with me to Isaiah chapter 42, please? Isaiah 42. I want to introduce this message by making a statement that some might interpret as being provocative, and I don't mean to be provocative. I'm not intending to split hairs, but just like in that hymn that we just sang, a little bit of leaven leavens the whole lump. I've titled this message, Our Sovereign God. And I want to introduce it by saying that I do not believe in the sovereignty of God. I'm not trusting the salvation of my soul in a doctrine. I believe in a God who is absolutely sovereign. What a difference. What a difference. You can adhere to the doctrine of total depravity and never be made a sinner. That's a work of grace in the heart. And God reveals to you that you are a sinner. You can adhere to the doctrine of limited atonement and never experience fellowship with Christ having taken away your sin once and for all. Our faith is not in a doctrine. Our faith is in a person. And he has revealed himself all throughout his word. But so gloriously here in Isaiah chapter 42, we looked at the first uh, four verses Sunday where God the Father is speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 5, God the Father reveals himself. And then in verses 6 and following, God the Father is speaking to the Lord Jesus Christ. The revelation that he makes of himself, he's the one. He's the one that we trust. Look at, uh, look at verse 5. Thus saith God the Lord. He, he that created the heavens. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 5. And stretcheth them out. He that spread forth the earth and that cometh out, and all that cometh out of it. He that giveth breath unto the people upon it and spirit to them that walk therein. God Almighty is telling us that he is the creator and sustainer of all of life. Physical life, spiritual life, everything is in his sovereign hand. What comfort, what hope, what peace the Lord gives to our hearts as he enables us to trust him. Now, doctrine is beneficial. Doctrine, the word doctrine means teaching. Um, But it's beneficial only to the extent that it teaches us about Christ. Leads us to him. You remember what the Lord said about the Pharisees who were very uh, uh, concerned about proper doctrine and about the scriptures. He said, you search the scriptures. You've spent all your life and all your energy fine-tuning your understanding of the scriptures. But these are they which testify 
of me. Oh, how I hope that the Lord will will not allow us to fall short of knowing it. Come unto me. Learn of me. My sheep hear my voice and they follow after me. You can have doctrine and not have Christ. If you have Christ, you're going to have right doctrine. (laughs) You're going to have right doctrine. But so many have fallen short of knowing Christ. Doctrine, the doctrine of God's sovereignty will cause you to resign yourself to your circumstances. The person of the Lord Jesus Christ will cause you to rejoice in your circumstances. That's a big difference. Doctrine leads to fatalism. What will be, will be. It'll all work out. The person of the Lord Jesus Christ leads to hope. Hope. Joy. Doctrine will increase your knowledge about God. The person of the Lord Jesus Christ will reveal to you who God is. Doctrine will oftentimes lead to a love of learning. The person of the Lord Jesus Christ will teach you how to love. The big difference. The Lord's revealing himself. Behold my servant. Whom I uphold. Mine elect. In whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. And he shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. God the Father is pointing us to Christ. Telling us about who he is. And what he's done. He shall not cry. He shall not lift up. Should not cause his voice to be heard in the street. He doesn't have to go around uh, using uh, manipulation and pleading with men. No. He's omnipotent. He's sovereign. He's able to save. And he has saved. And he will save every one of his people. A bruised reed shall... He not break. <laughs> now we have to know Christ to, be, to get any comfort from this. <clears throat> Doctrine will give you an advantage in talking to men. Knowing Christ will enable you to talk to God. Big difference. Doctrine can be taught by men. Doctrine is logical. The person of the Lord Jesus Christ must be revealed. We cannot know him unless he reveals himself in us and to us. The person of the Lord Jesus Christ is experiential. He is. Thus saith the Lord. Verse 5. Thus saith God. (laughs) He is our God. Oh Lord, reveal yourself to me. Reveal Christ to me. I don't want to be, I don't want my faith to be cold, calculated, mechanical. I want it to be warm and alive. I need you to give me a new heart. Verse 6, the father begins to speak to Christ. Now I want to get in on that conversation, don't you? (laughs) I want to hear what God the Father has to say 
to the Lord Jesus Christ because in hearing, uh, in hearing his voice, we'll know him. My sheep hear my voice and they follow after me. And so God says to the Lord Jesus Christ, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness. He's not talking about our calling. He's talking about the call of Christ. He's still still talking about mine elect whom I have chosen. The one that I put my spirit upon. And now the father saying, I called you in righteousness. The righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ is more than just his moral perfection in his perfect obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, to the father, his righteousness goes to satisfying all the law. The law could not fully be satisfied just by our Lord's moral obedience in his life. What was the very first law that God gave? In the day in which you sin, you shall surely die. Sin required death. The Lord Jesus Christ had to die in order to establish all righteousness. That law had to be fulfilled also. Righteousness could not be established without the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Philippians chapter 3 tells us. Look, at, Let's go there for just a moment. We looked at this verse Sunday. Verse 6 in Philippians chapter 2, I'm sorry. Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made of himself no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. Don't you get offended when your religious friends and family members start trying to impress you with all the things that they're doing for God? Believers don't talk like that. We don't go around trying to impress men with our, do we, do we want to serve the Lord? Yes. Is our service in any way uh, satisfactory? (laughs) No, but his was. His was. The form of a servant made in the likeness of men and being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So the obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ goes beyond his moral perfection in satisfying the demands of the Ten Commandments. He did that. He's the end of the law for righteousness. But his death was part of that as well. He was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness. Go back with me to verse 6. The Lord Jesus Christ came forth voluntarily, but he did not come forth uncalled. God the Father called him. No man taketh this honor upon himself. Hebrews chapter 5. Turn with me to that passage. I want you to see this. Hebrews chapter 5. The Lord's talking about the function of the priest, Aaron in particular, that Aaron didn't choose this. He had to be called to this role in order to intercede for Israel. God had to call him. And uh, in Hebrews chapter five at verse four, and no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God as was Aaron, so also Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. The Lord Jesus Christ came voluntarily. He entered into a covenant with the Father in eternity past, but he was called. He was called. And that's why the scripture says in Psalm chapter 40, Lo, 
I come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me, I delight to do thy will, O God. The Lord Jesus Christ responded to the call of his father. And in obedience did everything the father called him to do. And that's what God requires for our salvation. For Christ to stand in our stead as our righteousness before God. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness. God the Father speaking to Christ. I've called thee. Did the Lord respond obediently to that call? Yes. Yes. Did he fulfill everything in the call of the Father on behalf of his people? Yes. I've called thee. In righteousness I've called thee. And uh, will hold uh, thy hand. (laughs) God the Father held the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ through all the work of redemption. Everything he did, he said, the words that I speak, I'm not the, my, my words, they're the Father's words. The work that I do this is the work that the Father gave me to do. Turn with me to Psalm 89. Verse 18. For the Lord is our defense and the Holy One of Israel is our King. Now we're talking about, this is a, this is a revelation of Christ. It's a revelation of our God and his sovereign grace. You ever heard someone say that, uh, they came to the doctrines of grace. (laughs) We don't come to the doctrines of grace. We come to Christ. He's, he, he's revealed in those precious doctrines, but we're not coming to a doctrine. For the Lord is our defense, the Holy One of Israel. He is our King. Then thou spakest in vision to thy Holy One. Now God the Father speaking in vision to Christ. And sayest, I have laid help upon one that is mighty. I have exalted one chosen out of the people. Here's Christ. (laughs) Behold my servant, mine elect, my chosen one. I have found David my servant. With uh, With my holy oil have I anointed him. He was anointed with the oil of gladness above his fellows. He came in the full anointing of the Holy Spirit as the Christ to accomplish the purpose for which God sent him, the salvation of his people. And he could do nothing but that. David, you know, is a picture of Christ. This isn't a revel- This isn't speaking of David. This is speaking of Christ. Look at verse twenty-one: "With whom my hand shall be established, my arm also shall strengthen him." So here we have God the Father speaking audibly from heaven at the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. God the Holy Spirit coming down in the form of a dove, anointing him. God the Son, the full triune God, how could he fail? He's not discouraged. Verse 22, the enemy shall not exact upon him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. I will beat down his foes before his face and plague them that hate him. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him. And in my name shall his horn be exalted. In my name shall his horn be exalted. Now you know the horn in the scripture is a picture of power. 
That's the, that's the end of the animal you don't want to be around. If you, if you, and, and, the, and his horn, the horn of his, of his power, his sovereign power, his sovereign grace, his sovereign glory. Turn back with me to our text. The Father held the hand of Christ in the work that he came to accomplish. And now the Father, this is the, this is the covenant promise that the Father is speaking to Christ. And he says in verse 6, I the Lord have called thee in righteousness and will hold thy hand and will keep thee. I'm not only going to sustain you in your work of redemption, but I'm going to keep the work that you've accomplished for all eternity. I'm going to keep thee. He made his work eternally prosperous. I will divide him a portion with the great. Isn't that what it says in Isaiah 53? The father shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. I will hold thy hand and I will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people. The, the objective of the call that the father put upon Christ and the reason why he anointed him is to make him to be the fulfillment of the covenant. A covenant is a promise. It's a treaty. It's an alliance. It's an agreement. And here's what God said. I've made, a co- I've made you to be a covenant of the people. Everything necessary for their salvation. The, all the promises of God, the scripture says, are yea and amen in Christ. Now that just means that all the promises of God are yes in Christ and fulfilled in Christ. God don't look anywhere else other than to your son for my acceptance before you. Don't look at me. Don't look at my service. Don't look at my prayers. Don't look at my promises. Don't look at anything that I have ever done. Look to Christ alone for my acceptance. I'm talking, I'm I'm praying to the Father that that's what he'll do. He's our surety. (laughs) Everything that God Almighty requires... He looks to Christ for. And that's what faith does. Faith is looking to the Lord Jesus Christ for all my acceptance before God. He acts in our stead to provide everything that we need. And that's what the Father says. I, I, I've called you. I called you in righteousness. Righteousness even unto death, the death of the cross, and I will hold thy hand and I will keep you. I'll provide for you. You're going to be successful. You're not going to be discouraged and, uh, and, and, and you're not going to fail. <laughs> He's already made that clear in verse 4, hasn't he? Here's the Father speaking to Christ. And he says, he says in, verse, in verse 6, I will give thee. For a covenant. And the only way that we're going to receive Christ is if God gives him to us. You're going to, God's going to have to give him. You're not going to, you're not going to persuade God. You're not going to offer God something that, uh, that, that he's going to reward you for. Um, it, it, it's going to have to be a free gift. And, and, and when the Lord teaches us that, then we... Quit trying to bargain with God, don't we? We quit, trying to, we quit trying to bring our knowledge or our understanding or our good works or our, our good intentions or, or, or anything to Him. And we become mercy beggars. Lord, you're going to have to give me Christ if I'm going to be saved. I, I, can, I can learn knowledge. I can learn doctrine. But if I'm going to know Christ, you're going to have to give him to me. You're going to have to make him to be my covenant. I'm completely dependent upon you for everything. 
You remember, you remember the, the story of the man that had a withered hand? Stretch forth thy hand. <laughs> I've heard people say, uh, you know, it, it's not, God would not require you to do something that you can't do. That's it. Everything God requires of us, we can't do. You know, why would God say believe on the Lord Jesus Christ unless you're able to believe? <laughs> Lord, I can't believe. I can't see. I can't come. I, I'm, I'm going to have, you're going to have to do everything. You have to cause me to come unto thee. And here's the, here's the glorious hope we have that God's command to come is our warrant for coming. So when he said to that man, stretch forth thy hand, what's he going to say? Well, I, I can't. It's crippled. Hey, stretched it forth. <laughs> Peter said, Peter and John at the gate called beautiful said to that blind man, silver and gold have we none, but such as we have, we give unto thee. We give unto thee <laughs> in the name of Jesus Christ, stand and walk. And what happened? He stood and he leaped. Never walked in his life, and now he's leaping. <laughs> I will give you as a covenant of the people. The promise of God. What did David say? Although my house be not so with God, yet he has made with me an everlasting covenant ordered in all things ordered in all things everything necessary to ratify this covenant everything necessary to fulfill the requirements of this covenant are ordered and sure and david said this is all my salvation all my desire though he make it not to grow i look at myself and i don't see do you see growth in grace in yourself? You don't, do you? When you look at yourself, you just think, you know, I, I, I'm just getting worse. And that's what David was saying, although he make it not to grow. Don't look for growth in grace in yourself. Don't look for evidence of salvation in yourself. You'll either be horribly discouraged or, or you'll be deceived. One or the other. You'll either be discouraged or deceived. You'll lie to yourself and thinking, well, you know, there's some good stuff going on there. Or if you're an honest person, you'll look at your life and you'll think, oh, Lord. Oh, wretched man that I am. I can't get out of my own way. Can't get out of my own way. You have that problem? I will give him as a covenant of the people. He's the promise of God. Everything God requires of you and me, he looks to Christ for. Are you looking where God's looking? That's why, that's why the Lord lets us in on this conversation that he's having with his son. God the Father is speaking to Christ. And he's letting us get in on this so we can know where, where he is. For verse 6, the last part of verse 6. And now we get down to the effects of the call of Christ Upon his people. Here's the effects. That the call of Christ has. On the people of God. For a light. Of the Gentiles. You have some light don't you. You do. I hope you do. There was a time when you could not see. That you were nothing but sin. And now that's crystal clear to you, isn't it? There was a time when you could not see 
that the Lord Jesus Christ was all your righteousness before God. And now that's the only hope you've got. The time you couldn't believe the gospel. You had no interest in the gospel. And now it's your life. It's your life. It's everything to you. This is the effects of the anointing of the Lord Jesus. I'm going to make you a light to the Gentiles. There was a time when you read the Bible and you thought it was nothing more than a book of rules and regulations and doctrine and theology and history. And you prided yourself in the little bit of knowledge you had and giving you an advantage over someone else. And now you know, in the volume of the book it is written of me. If they speak not according to the law and the testimony, it is because there is no light in them. And when the light of the gospels gets turned on, when God turns it on and reveals the gospel in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then you, then you see this book's all about him. It's all about him. From beginning to end, it's all about him. In the beginning, God, that's Christ. Even so, Lord Jesus, come. That's Christ. From Genesis 1-1 to the end of the book of Revelation, it's all about him, isn't it? I've, came, I've come to bring a light to the Gentiles to open the blind eyes. I was talking to somebody recently and they were feeling intimidated because they could not answer the interrogation of unbelievers uh, when it comes to the gospel. And I said, you know, you, you, you've had that problem. You, you've, you've had unbelievers want to interrogate you over what you believe, and, and you didn't feel like you gave an adequate answer. And I, and I reminded them of what that blind man, you remember they brought him before, he'd been blind all his life. And uh, they brought him before the Pharisees, and the Pharisees started interrogating him. Who is this that healed you? And... and uh, Remember what he said? Listen, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> All I know is that once I was blind and now I see. There was a time when I couldn't see Christ. There was a time when I couldn't see myself. There was a time when I didn't know how it is that God puts away my sin. But now I know. Can I give you chapter and verse? Not always. Can I, can I compete with you theologically and debate these things with you? No. But I can tell you this. Christ gave me light. He is my light. I know the truth. That's what he said. When, when he makes him a covenant for the people, he'll be a light to the Gentiles and he'll open the blind eyes. Open the blind eyes. To bring out the prisoners from the prison. You were held captive. Couldn't see, couldn't believe, couldn't come, didn't have an interest in the gospel. Don't you love the story of Samson going into the Philistine city and taking those gates and putting them on his shoulder and carrying them out? And, and, and what did the Lord say to to? Uh, uh, to Peter when he asked Peter, whom do men say that I am? And Peter said, well, some say that you're John the Baptist, come back to life. Some Elijah, one of the prophets. And then the Lord said, okay, that's, that's their theological discussions and debates. Who do you say that I am? What did Peter say? Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. We know and are sure of that. Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood didn't reveal this unto, me, unto you. You could be out there having these discussions with those folks out there. My Father, which is in heaven, has revealed to you who I am. And upon this rock, what rock? The confession you just made that I'm the Christ, the anointed one, the Son of the living God. I'm going to build my church. 
I'm going to build my church upon that, upon that foundation. I am the foundation stone. <laughs> and the gates of hell shall not be able to prevail against it. There's the gospel going out into the world. There's Samson taking away those. There's, this, there's the strong man. There's the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because that's where all of his people are. They're in the pit of hell. Until the Lord sets the prisoner free, that's where they are. They're under the dominion of Satan. They're dead. They're blind. They're unable to believe. And here's what he says he's going to do. I'm going to bring out of out the prisoners from the prison. Say, well, I've never been in prison. I, you know, some folks might think that. I've never been in prison. I'm free. I've always been free. A person that would talk like that is in prison and they don't know it. They're in prison they don't know it. Was there a time when you weren't free? You were blinded by the God of this world? Look at the last part of verse 7. And them that sit in darkness, out of the prison house. Out of the prison house. (laughs) Now I'm free. There was a time when I was under the law. Was under the law. And what did Paul say in Galatians? Oh, foolish, oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Don't go back to the law. Don't measure your salvation by your obedience. Look to Christ. Verse 8. Well, before we, before we go to verse 8, let me just uh, take us to Isaiah 35, if you will. Turn back with me a couple pages. We're talking about seeing and feeling the gracious effects of the gospel in our hearts. Isaiah chapter 35, look at verse 3. Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. And he did. He trampled out the winepress of the fury of his wrath. He came with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He paid the debt for our sins. He will come and save you. And that's what he came to do, to save his people. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing, for in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert. See, doctrine can't do this for you. It can't. We, we, we don't believe in, we don't believe in unconditional election. We believe in a God who has elected a people without any condition placed on them. Verse 7, and the parched ground shall become a pool and the thirsty land springs of water in the habitation of dragons 
Where each lay shall be grass with reeds and rushes, and a highway shall be there, and a way, and it should be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those the wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err therein. Lord, that's me. I'm a wayfaring man. Left to myself, I'm nothing but a fool. What's the promise that I have? Christ has saved me. And he's not going to let me. He's not going to, he's not going to, take, he's not going to let me get away from there. <laughs> from him. <laughs> they shall not err. They shall not err. They will persevere. Why? Because he's going to keep them from falling. You see, we don't believe in the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. We believe that doctrine's true. But we believe in a God who causes us to persevere. Verse 8. Isaiah 42, verse 8. I am the Lord. That is my name. (laughs) You know, every time L-O-R-D is in all caps, it's Jehovah. It's Yahweh. It's It's the name that God gave Moses at the burning bush. When Moses said, whom shall I say sent me? And what did the Lord say? Tell them I am hath sent thee. I am. I am that I am. (laughs) I'm the creator and sustainer of all of life. I'm the savior of sinners. I'm not like you. I'm I'm not contingent on anything. I'm not dependent upon anything. I am. I save in the manner in which I save. I'll have mercy upon whom I will have mercy and whom I will I'll harden. I'm sovereign. I'm omnipotent. (laughs) Oh, Lord. And, And if you see that just as a doctrine, then you'll just become fatalistic. Oh, well, you know, it'll just it'll just all work out. But if you see that as a description of the God that you serve, the God that you worship, then you'll fall, you'll, you'll fall on your face before him and worship him. Worship him. I am the Lord. That is my name. And my glory will I not give to another. <laughs> oh, I'm so thankful. He doesn't share his glory. The gospel of God's free grace in the accomplished work and glorious person of the Lord Jesus Christ is the only message for sinners that gives to God all the glory. All the glory. I'll not share my glory with another. I'm not going to give you anything to glory in. I'm going to get all the glory. I'm going to to get the glory for having chosen you I'm going to get the glory for having redeemed you I'm going to get the glory for having regenerated you I'm going to get the glory for keeping you I'm going to get the glory for sanctifying you I'm going to get the glory for bringing you safely home and glorifying you I'm going to do it all and I'm not going to let you participate in it (laughs) I am the Lord. That is my name. And I will not share my glory with another. I'm going to get all the glory, neither my praise to graven images. And that's what every religious opinion of the world is. It's a graven image. It's an idol. And every single one of us came into this world as an idolater. And the Lord has to deliver us from idolatry and cause us to worship him. 
And the means by which he does that is the revelation that he's made of himself in his word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing comes by the word of God. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. In the volume of the book it is written to me. It's, this is it, isn't it? This is who he is. And God's people say, Amen. That's my God. Our Heavenly Father, we're so very, very thankful for the revelation that you have graciously made of yourself and your dear Son. We pray that your Holy Spirit would give to us faith to not believe in a doctrine, but believe in Christ. Believe in you, Father. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Number 225. Let's stand together. Oh.